In this issue of ABC's Wide World of Flying, Bill Cox takes you to Hawaii and shows you how to rent a plane and fly the islands. Captain Barry Schiff explains the somewhat lost art of slipping to control descent rate. Engine expert Kaz Thomas shows you the fine points of using an EGT gauge for leaning. In his What's New segment, Phil Boyer shows you an ultimate EGT and CHT gauge, the InSight graphic engine monitor. From the AOPA Air Safety Foundation, Rod Machado gives you some important tips on aircraft tie-downs. And Warbird instructor Jeff Ethel takes you up for a checkout in what many regard as the best propeller-driven fighter of all time, the North American P-51. In our bonus buyer's guide at the end of this tape, ICOM Electronics shows you its exciting handheld aviation transceiver. 3M demonstrates its all-new StormScope weather avoidance system. John and Martha King bring you their newest tips on flying technique. And Pilot's Video Source shows you several more exciting new videotapes for aviation and history buffs. All this and more in this issue of ABC's Wide World of Flying. Welcome to a very special video edition of ABC's Wide World of Flying. Special because it's the end of our second year, our eighth videotape. And as you can see from our opening, special for Bill Cox because he got the warm weather Hawaiian assignment, leaving me out here in the cold. For my aviation commentary, I'd like to turn the calendar back one year when I sat in the cockpit of another Cessna 340. At that time, I outlined the mess that the FAA had created with a minimum equipment list rule for Part 91 operators. Without an approved MEL, every piece of equipment in a plane had to work down to the cigarette lighter or it couldn't be flown. The catch-22 was that the local flight standard district offices couldn't handle the workload of the MELs that began coming in. My submission on the Baron took a year for a reply, well after I'd sold the airplane. Well, with a little nudging from people like ourselves and a great deal of help from AOPA, the rule has been amended. The FAA will now allow pilots of small, piston-powered general aviation planes to make their own decisions regarding a flight with inoperative equipment. Basically, the new Part 91.3 allows a pilot to take off without an approved MEL as long as the original VFR Day certification standards are met, and the equipment malfunctioning is not required by any other FAR or AD for that type of flight. This means that a burned-out nav light won't ground your airplane for a daytime flight. However, it would be required if that flight were to take place at night. Now, obviously, this is a much more common-sense approach to the problem. Now, the equipment must be either removed or placarded. For many items, this can be a fairly simple task, like uh, removing a broken Loran from the panel and sending it to the shop for repair. Or, in another item, uh, putting an in-op sticker on top of a DG that's malfunctioning on the co-pilot side. In addition, either you as the licensed pilot or your certified mechanic must determine that the inoperative equipment does not constitute a hazard to flying the aircraft. For instance, my 340 has continental gear-driven alternators. Before departing VFR daytime with one malfunctioning, which would be legal, I'd want a mechanic to determine that it will not damage the engine. The responsibility now rests where it should, with the pilot of an aircraft. 
However, expect the FAA to crack down by enforcing the equipment lists that are part of almost every pilot operating handbook. Make sure that you're familiar with what equipment is necessary for your particular type of flight. This upholds your end of this greatly appreciated regulation. Well, now, let's get out of this cold airplane and into a warmer climate. Bill Cox shows us how to enjoy flying while visiting those inviting mid-Pacific Hawaiian Islands. As you might have guessed, this is a Pan Am 747, the largest airliner in commercial service between Los Angeles and Honolulu. Our mission today for ABC's Wide World of Flying is to ride Pan Am from LAX to HNL. A tough job, but as the old saying goes, someone has to do it. The great circle distance from Los Angeles to Honolulu is just over 2,200 nautical miles. Obviously not a flight for most general aviation aircraft. The 747 with triple inertial nav units, triple HF in a 6,000 nautical mile range, is well suited for the Hawaiian run. Cruising seven miles up at 0.84 Mach, or about 485 knots. That means we should be landing in Honolulu in just about five hours. Honolulu International is the Chicago of the Pacific, crossroads for air traffic to the Orient and points south and west. The 50th state is the most popular vacation spot in America, and once you arrive in the islands, all pilots are created equal. No matter what you fly at home, you'll need to rent an airplane to tour Hawaii by air, and we've come to Air Service Corporation, one of the largest operators of light aircraft in Hawaii, to do just that. Our first flight from Honolulu will take us counterclockwise east and then north around most of the island of Oahu. Honolulu International is certainly one of the easier big airports to operate in and out of. Hawaii's only TCA is relatively small and the controllers go out of their way to facilitate uh, entry and exit to the TCA and the airport itself. The departure procedures from uh, south uh, southeast ramp are extremely good. Uh, they managed to get you out uh, very quickly with a minimum of confusion on the ground. This is 786 runway 4 clear for takeoff. Departing Honolulu International, ATC procedures really are extremely simple. The controllers work hard to keep things uncomplicated for mainlanders. Our first destination is Ford Island, a training reliever field only about three miles from HNL. Touch and goes are obviously a little impractical at the International Jetport, and accordingly, the Navy allows civilians to use Ford for landing practice, provided no one disembarks from the aircraft. The island is only lightly manned with Navy personnel and is no longer an active installation. Just east of Ford Island in Pearl Harbor is one of the most famous monuments of World War II, the Arizona Memorial, built directly above the sunken battleship Arizona, where nearly 1,200 sailors died on the morning of December 7, 1941. Waikiki Beach is probably the best known in the world, and it's only about two miles east of the airport on the Freeway 3 departure. The Waikiki is glamorous, luxurious, and expensive, we're about to see a lot more of Hawaii than just Honolulu. Diamond Head is the city's most recognizable landmark, a dormant volcanic crater that rises almost 800 feet above the sea. Cocoa Head beyond Diamond Head is another popular volcano, 1,200 feet tall and an ideal location for the line of sight signal from a VOR. We'll use Cocoa Head VOR later on the overwater leg across Kaui Channel when we visit Molokai, Maui, and Lanai. 
Past Cocoa Head, the island of Oahu becomes less commercial and more scenic. Though you will spot the popular Hawaii Sea Life Park and an occasional old World War II military airport below. On a clear day, you can see all the way up the coast and across the narrow channel to Molokai and Maui's 10,000-foot Mount Haleakala. Not far from Kailua City, Kaneohe Naval Air Station on Oahu's northeast shore has to be one of the best duty assignments in the world for Navy fighter pilots. It's just down the coast from the world-famous Turtle Bay Hilton Hotel. Two other points of interest to look for on a flying tour of Oahu are the giant experimental wind machine near Kahuku Point and famous North Beach, home of the Surfer's Paradise Banzai Pipeline. Dillingham Airport on the north shore of Oahu is the Hawaiian headquarters for anything to do with sport aviation. It's a spectacular airport with a typical lush Hawaiian beach on one side and steep green cliffs on the other. Because of those cliffs and the strong upslope wave action they generate, Dillingham is a popular sailplane base where gliders can soar back and forth above the airport for hours. As you might have guessed, this isn't the Skyhawk we arrived at Dillingham in just a few minutes ago. This is a Schweitzer 232 glider operated by Honolulu Soaring. Bill Starr, the owner of Honolulu Soaring, has agreed to give us a slightly different perspective of the Dillingham area. That is, in this case, without an engine. Bill, are we ready to go up there? Absolutely, Bill. We're ready. Let's do it. Virtually all my previous soaring experience was in the Southern California desert near El Mirage Dry Lake. So flying a glider around tropical Hawaii proved to be quite a bit different. Bill Starr mentioned that Dillingham has so much lift that several world endurance records have been set gliding back and forth above the airport. Many truly dedicated mainland sailplane pilots even travel all the way to Dillingham specifically to earn their Diamond Award for Endurance. Sailplanes are always a kick, especially when flying over such spectacular scenery as Hawaii. Whether you choose to fly around Dillingham with or without power, however, be aware that restricted areas 3109 and 3110 are related to a potentially dangerous microwave satellite tracking station. Stray over the facilities at the wrong time, and the resulting microwave burns may be worse than a slap on the wrist certificate action by the FAA. Today we'll fly between the two nearest points of land on our slightly off airways route from Oahu to Kauai at 4,500 feet. Okay, we're coming across Kaina Point. That's the last point of land on Oahu on our way to Kauai this morning. 
And right about now, it's time for us to call Honolulu Flight Service and let them know we're departing Kaina on our overwater leg. Known as the Garden Isle, Kauai sits out all by itself about 65 nautical miles northwest of Oahu. This is the longest overwater leg between islands in Hawaii, but even in a skyhawk, it shouldn't take over 45 minutes to cross the Kauai Channel. In fact, the entire eight island Hawaiian chain is only about 350 nautical miles long, easily within a Skyhawk's one tank range. One of the weather phenomenon you'll encounter uh, in tropical islands is that typically uh, there'll be heat buildup over the land and none over the water. As a result, you'll have usually a little grouping of clouds directly over all the land masses, in this case, the islands. Out over the water between the islands, it'll be clear of clouds, generally. This is because there's little convection activity over the water, but there's considerably more over the land. Hawaii also utilizes a feature known as the Island Reporting Service. This is essentially a service offered by Honolulu Radio, which monitors transmissions from flights flying between islands. In this case, we're just about the center of the Kauai Channel between Oahu and the island of Kauai. We're going to call up Honolulu Radio and tell them. Honolulu Radio, Cessna 9er, 9er 786, mid Kauai Channel, 4500 at 1945 Greenwich. Honolulu Radio, Cessna 9er, 9er 786, we're a beam Lahui for landing uh, at Port Allen. I'd like to cancel our VFR flight plan, Honolulu to Port Allen. Thank you, sir. The trip to Kauai is well worth the trouble, as this small 25-mile diameter circular island boasts some of the most spectacular scenery in Hawaii. Okay, we're making landfall just about over Makawena Point off Kauai. That's about equidistant between Lahui, which is the FAA tower-controlled airport, and Port Allen, which is our destination today. The 2,400-foot uncontrolled strip right on the beach on the south shore. In fact, this looks like just about the farthest south point on the island of Kauai. Way off in the distance, uh, you can see privately owned secluded Nihau, which doesn't welcome overflying tourists at all. And Cessna 99786 is downwind for Port Allen. Now, that overwater flight wasn't so difficult, was it? Even if you've never been to Kauai, the lush tropical look of the island may seem familiar to you. That's because it's been used as a motion picture and television location for years. The beach at the end of runway 27 at Port Allen is nearly ideal for fly-in tourists. There are even picnic tables where you and the ants can share your bologna sandwich. Keep in mind, however, that you should park your aircraft on the far eastern side of Port Allen Airport and walk down to the beach. Also remember that Port Allen has no fuel, so you should fuel up at either Oahu, Dillingham, or Lahui before flying over to Port Allen. Flying northwest out of Port Allen Airport, you can circumnavigate the entire island of Kauai in less than a half hour. Leaving Port Allen, certainly one of the most impressive geological wonders of Hawaii is Waimea Canyon, more commonly called the Grand Canyon of the Pacific. It covers virtually the entire southwest corner of the island, and not too surprisingly, looks like a miniature version of its namesake in Arizona.
You can't help but speak in superlatives when talking about the island of Kauai. The Nepali coast is certainly one of the most beautiful in the world, with steep, multicolored cliffs that reach from the surf several thousand feet into the sky. What you've just seen was a nearly circular tour of Kauai by fixed-wing Skyhawk. Just as this morning, though, we want to give you a different perspective on Kauai, so this time we'll tour the island by helicopter. If you think flying Hawaii in a general aviation fixed-wing airplane is fun, you ought to try it in a rotary-wing aircraft. The man to my right has been doing just that for several years. Dan Lanier is senior pilot for Papillon Hawaiian Helicopter, located here on Princeville Airport on the island of Kauai. Dan, what uh, safety advantages do you feel helicopters have over fixed-wing general aviation aircraft for sightseeing in the Kauai area? You're not committed to speed in the helicopter, so you're a lot less worried about the winds. It takes turbulence much better, and uh, if you want to go low and slow, get close to things and hover, obviously the helicopter is the only way. What sort of things do you show the people uh, when they come in on the tours uh, around the Kauai area? We like to go back in the places that uh, people have never been before, back in the back of the valleys and the rainforest, and uh, why don't I show you? That sounds like a good idea to me. Let's do it. It's really spectacular to be able to tour Hawaii from the air, especially in a helicopter where you have the capability to hover and to look down at slow speed rather than rip across the terrain at 100 knots or more. Okay, as you can see now, we're going up a valley, uh, one of the really narrow valleys on the inland portion of the island of Kauai. This is the sort of thing you just flat couldn't do with a fixed-wing aircraft. Also, this is obviously a blind canyon. Uh, we're going to fly up to the end of it, make a 180, and head back out the way we came in. The next minute of technically excellent video imagery was provided by Papillon Hawaiian Helicopters, based in Princeville, Kauai, and Kahului, Maui. There are still several more islands to see, so we've fired up the Skyhawk again for the return flight to Honolulu. Tomorrow we'll tour Molokai, Maui, and Lanai. Our first leg today is a mere 23 nautical miles across the Kaui Channel to Molokai. That's in contrast to yesterday's 65 mile crossing to Kauai. If you look down below the aircraft here, you can see we've got quite a bit of whitecap activity. A lot of wind today between the islands and the channel separating Oahu and Molokai. It wouldn't be a good day to have to ditch an airplane, but fortunately with the reliability of these Lycoming 0320 engines in the Skyhawk, that's a pretty remote possibility. Also, fortunately, Air Service equips all their airplanes with life vests and a four-man life raft for each aircraft. So, if you did go in, uh, you'd at least be well equipped to handle uh, the conditions that prevail. We're looking over the nose at the island of Molokai. Molokai is a relatively undeveloped island of the eight islands of the Hawaiian chain. There are very few tourist facilities on the island, 
and we're going to be flying down the far northeastern coast of Molokai on our way down to Kahului on the island of Maui later this morning. Also off to the far right you can see in the distance the island of Lanai. In this case the distance is only about 20 miles. Again, uh, the space between islands is extremely short. So your flight time is minimized and your exposure to the overwater risk is uh, pretty brief. All right, we're just coming across the coast of Molokai now, so we're gonna call uh, the Island Reporting Service again and let them know we've cleared the channel. Just coming up on the right side of the airplane is uh, Molokai's main airport. We're looking down at uh, Kalapapa Airport. This is fairly close to the Hawaiian State Hospital that treats leprosy and other diseases. Just south of Kalapapa is Molokai's rugged, near vertical north coast. This is the tropical side of Molokai, so you can see the uh, clouds building right over the cliffs on the edge of the island. A little radio, Cessna 900 under 786, do you read? Cessna 900 under 786, Cessna 900 out again. Okay, we've got you loud and clear now, sir. We're just uh, mid Molokai to Maui Channel. Pretty strong headwinds up here today. We're flight planned for uh, one hour even, Honolulu to Oscar Golf Golf. Wonder if you could extend that by about uh, 15 minutes. We're going pretty slow in these headwinds. Roger, we're extending minutes. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Kahului Airport on Maui is the home of American Flyers, an FBO that rents 152s, Skyhawks, and Beach Musketeers, and provided the second of our Skyhawks. Retired airline captain Lynn Cowper runs American Flyers and is an expert on flying Maui. When it comes to flying around Maui, it's really hard to know where to begin. There's so much to see, so many beautiful sights to be seen, particularly from the air. We have 360 days of sunshine, blue sky, and the surf. If you fly northeast out of Maui, out of Kahului Airport here, you can see the jungle on the way up to Hana. You can see the waterfalls there. Continue along the south shore behind Haleakala Mountain, which is rising uh, 10,000 feet there. And then you can circle around Malakini Island. You can continue on uh, northwest and follow the shoreline of West Maui past old Lahaina Town, the old whaling village there and from there along Kanapali shore. Now if you want to, you can continue on around the uh, northwest tip of Maui and back here to Kahului Airport. And that whole trip right around Maui will run you about 1.3 on the hops. Though it's certainly a great place to fly, Kahului is also one of the windier airports in Hawaii with regular afternoon breezes to 30 knots. My departure, uh, Cessna 624 is with you climbing to 1.5. In Hawaii, pilots have the best of all possible vantage points. Many people consider Maui's northeast coast toward Hana to be about as close as you can come to paradise. To keep it that way, the road from Kahului to Hana is rough, winding, and best negotiated with four-wheel drive and plenty of patience. Flying tourists can make the short 30-mile flight in 15 minutes, but the groundbound can take all day to reach Hana. The airport sits right on the jagged black volcanic beach, certainly a scenic coast, but unusable for anything except sightseeing. Hana, uh, Cessna 624 is the left base for runway 8. The Hana area is so remote and breathtaking, you almost expect to see Adam and Eve's descendants playing in the water at Kapahulu Falls and Seven Pools. In fact, the area is so idyllic and out of the way that Charles Lindbergh, the reclusive aviation pioneer, lived his final years in the Hana area. Perhaps appropriately, Lindbergh is buried on a hillside overlooking the Hana airport. 
Keep in mind if you do decide to fly down to Hana that there's no fuel available on the airport, so you'll need to fuel up at Kahului before flying down the coast. Turbulence and weather permitting, you'll want to stay low out of Hana as the coast along the back side of the island is absolutely breathtaking. If you look carefully, you'll see water cascading down the sides of the hills and tumbling into the Pacific. Around the corner from Hana near Kamanamana Point is a huge black lava flow only about 100 years old, a reminder of the last eruption of Mount Haleakala. If the atmospherics are willing and the peak isn't covered by clouds, Mount Haleakala itself is a majestic sight, complete with a volcanic crater that's so unearthly, the Apollo astronauts trained there for their moon missions. If you have the time, one of the more interesting diversions at Haleakala is the 40-mile bike ride from the summit all the way down the mountain to the bottom. No, you don't have to pump your way up the mountain. You ride to the top by bus. Coming up below the aircraft, uh, you'll see a half-moon crater sticking out of the Pacific between Koolave, the Gunnery Island, and Maui. Molokini is a scuba diver's paradise. It's a volcanic crater that's uh, sticking out of the water about 300 feet. Lanai is a sleepy little island without much tourist development. But luxurious Club Lanai, a Hawaiian version of Club Med, sits on the northeast beach facing Maui. Just up the Lanai coast, you'll see the disintegrating wreck of a freighter that ran aground during World War II and has now turned to a rusting hulk. Straight across from Lanai is the old whaling village of Lahaina, now one of the island's most popular tourist attractions. Old Lahaina offers a refreshing look back at Hawaii's past, to the days when the islands were still remote and known only to whalers, fishermen, and the local natives. Northwest of Lahaina is the famous Kanapali Coast, where most of the island's major hotels are located. Unfortunately, bad weather prevented us from visiting Hilo and the Kona Coast on the Big Island of Hawaii, where some other luxurious new hotels are located. If you get the impression Hawaii truly is a tropical Eden for pilots, you've got the right message. The weather is idyllic most of the time, distances are short, there are plenty of airports, and because so much of Hawaii is still undeveloped, you'll see things from the sky that you simply can't see from any other perspective. If you're planning a vacation to America's tropical islands of paradise, you can add a new dimension to your trip by looking down on Hawaii from a light plane. There once was a time when the intentional slip was a necessary part of every pilot's repertoire. Now this was back when wings often didn't have flaps, and the only way to steepen a landing approach without building airspeed was to slip. Unfortunately, today the slip has become somewhat of an anachronism. Slip training is de-emphasized, and the practice of slipping is becoming a lost art. Now this is unfortunate because the slip can be a life-saving maneuver. Think back to 1983. Do you remember that Boeing 767 that was cruising at 41,000 feet north of Winnipeg, Canada, when without warning, both engines flamed out? Because of an error committed on the ground, the airplane was completely out of fuel. The captain established the powerless jetliner in a normal glide and headed toward a former Air Force base about 60 miles away. But while on final approach to the 8,000-foot runway, he recognized that the wide-body Boeing was too high. Drawing on his general aviation experience, he lowered a wing, applied opposite rudder, and skillfully slipped off the excess altitude to prevent an overshoot. Being able to slip can be useful during other emergencies, too. 
For example, if your flaps become inoperative, you can use a slip to create drag and reduce aircraft speed. Or if a door pops open, a slip is useful to assist in closing that door. Or in the case of an engine fire, a slip can be used to divert smoke and flames away from the cockpit during an emergency landing. Since slipping can be a valuable addition to anyone's arsenal of piloting skills, let's go on up and review some of the basic principles. Now, before we get into flying technique, it's important that you remember exactly what a slip is and how it differs from a skid. A slip occurs when the bank angle is too steep for the rate of turn. Now, usually it results from not using enough rudder when entering or recovering from a turn, or inadvertently holding top rudder while turning. Now, the airplane flies sideways. The pilot and passengers tend to lean toward the inside of the turn and the ball falls toward the low wing or the inside of the turn. A skid, on the other hand, is the result of excessive rudder application. Now, those inside the airplane tend to lean opposite the turn and the ball is forced to the outside of the turn. The most significant difference between a slip and a skid becomes apparent when the airplane is made to stall while skidding. If you remember our feature on spins from issue 5, the excessive rudder being applied in a skid may cause the airplane to spin in the direction of the yaw. Now there's no difference between an intentional spin and one that results from an inadvertent skid. The pro-spin force is the same. Happily, a slip poses no such hazard especially when performed during a power-off or low-power approach. Now, if the airplane in a slip is made to stall, it displays very little tendency to yaw one way or the other. Now, the aircraft may tend to roll into a wings-level attitude, but, but that's about it. However, it's never a good idea to stall on an approach in any event, even if you know you're not about to spin. Okay, we're set up on a final approach for runway 24 here at Cable Airport in Upland, California. It's a 3,600-foot runway, and we're too high, as you can see. So I'd like to take you through a forward slip just to show you how it's done. I've completed the pre-landing checklist, and the, and the power's back. The intentional forward slip is a cross-controlled maneuver that consists of banking in one direction while holding just enough opposite rudder to prevent turning. This forces the airplane to fly somewhat sideways toward the low wing and significantly increases drag. That's why an aircraft in a slip can descend more rapidly without picking up airspeed. For practice by pilots unaccustomed to slipping, I recommend recovery at least two to three hundred feet above ground level. Just roll into a wings level attitude and simultaneously release rudder pressure. The airplane recovers easily and naturally. Okay, now for some fine points. We're high on final approach. Again, stabilized at a descent rate of about 900 feet a minute at 70 knots with full flaps. Now, the slip is not an abrupt maneuver. You just roll the airplane gently into the desired bank and apply whatever opposite rudder is needed just to prevent the airplane from turning in the direction of the lowered wing. The sink rate is controlled by the bank angle. If you want to descend at a steeper angle, you crank in a steeper bank, and you hold your heading with more rudder. In most airplanes, though, the slip is rudder limited. You're going to hit the limit of rudder travel, even though the ailerons are capable of steepening the bank even further. Right now, we're slipping about as much as we can. We've got a descent rate of about 1,400 feet per minute, and our airspeed is still the same, 70 knots. With maximum rudder being applied, you might think that we've attained the maximum sink rate possible, but you'd be wrong. If you need to descend more rapidly, just lower the nose. Now, diving slightly not only increases the sink rate, it results in more airspeed. And this greater airspeed, in turn, increases rudder effectiveness, which allows us to crank in more bank angle for a steeper slip. Now this technique can produce some pretty impressive sink rates. Right now we're going down about 2,000 feet a minute. But conversely, when the nose is raised, we lose some airspeed, rudder effectiveness decreases, and we have to reduce the bank angle. But with experience, a pilot can slip safely to within inches of the runway, flare, 
and recover from the maneuver immediately before touchdown. Okay, let's do another one. Which direction should you slip? Right wing down or left wing? Now, most pilots prefer to slip with the left wing down simply because it gives them a better view of the runway. However, the direction of the forward slip usually is dictated by wind direction. You should slip into the direction of the crosswind if you have one. Now, if you have a crosswind from the left, then slip to the left. But if the crosswind is from the right, slip with the right wing down and you'll be set up for a perfect touchdown. When slipping, attitude is the key to speed control, not the airspeed indicator. Now, since the relative wind is approaching the aircraft at an angle, the airspeed indicator may be unreliable in a slip, now, especially if your airplane has only one static port on one side of the fuselage. Now, just maintain approximately the same pitch attitude you would use in a normal glide. Now, be aware that this usually requires forward pressure on the control wheel to counter the nose-up tendency created by holding top rudder in a slip. Now, once the airplane is stabilized in the slip, you may need to vary heading slightly to maintain the desired ground track. Now, the easiest way to do this is to adjust the bank angle while holding a fixed amount of rudder. In other words, steepening bank angle causes a turn toward the low wing, while decreasing bank angle slightly produces a turn in the opposite direction. Now, so far, I've been discussing the forward slip. Now, this is when the airplane is tracking along the extended center line of the runway. There are a few variations on this theme. The side slip is used to track toward the runway at an angle. Now, the mechanics are the same as the forward slip. Now, the only difference is the airplane's track over the ground. In a side slip, bank angle determines not only sink rate, but also how rapidly the airplane moves laterally toward the extended runway centerline. Usually, a side slip is performed with a heading that parallels the runway. If the airplane turns toward the runway, add additional opposite rudder or decrease bank angle. But if the airplane turns away from the runway, decrease rudder or increase bank angle. Forward slips and side slips are usually performed while maintaining a fixed heading. But there are times when a slipping turn might come in handy. Now the easiest way to enter a slipping turn is first to begin a normal turn. Then simultaneously apply aileron in the direction of the turn and some opposite rudder to prevent the bank angle from increasing. The amount of slipping is determined by the amount of cross controlling that you do. Rate of turn is increased by further steepening the bank angle or reducing rudder, and vice versa. To recover, simply neutralize the ailerons and the rudder. Here's a few final tips. Before executing a slip, be sure to let your passengers know what to expect so they won't be alarmed, and caution them not to lean against a door lest they pop it open and give everyone a bit of anxiety. When recovering from a slip, many pilots sense having more airspeed than was indicated. And they're right. Now take a look at this diagram, and you'll see what I mean. When slipping, this vector represents our indicated airspeed. But this vector, which is longer, represents our actual speed because this is the direction in which the airplane is actually moving. And as you can see, actual speed is greater than indicated speed. And this small vector, of course, represents our lateral or sideways velocity. It's important to remember never to perform a slip or a skid in any airplane with a low fuel supply. The maneuver could unport a fuel line, resulting in fuel starvation to the engine. Now, don't get the idea that every slip has to be some big radical maneuver. I've used almost imperceptible slips to bleed off a bit of airspeed in wide-body jets. Slipping should not be considered as a crutch for a poor approach, but instead think of it as another important skill. Now although you may seldom need to slip, you should practice the maneuver often enough to maintain proficiency. And you should learn to do it with finesse. Slipping safely is far better 
than slipping up. Just as I've respected Barry Schiff for his outstanding pilot proficiency books and numerous magazine articles, I've also looked to Kaz Thomas for common sense approaches to aircraft maintenance, particularly engine-related items. Now, besides being founder and editor of Light Plane Maintenance, and most recently having taken over as editor of IFR, Kaz has written numerous books on airplane maintenance. The most recent is the subject of this report. EGT systems. My mechanical knowledge is best illustrated when I have car trouble. Up goes the hood on the side of the highway and I call the auto club. Owning an airplane has forced me to learn more about systems and Cass has offered to show me how to properly lean the engines in my Cessna 340 by proper use of the EGT gauge. Cass, why not use the fuel flow needles for leaning rather than the EGT? Well, Phil, your fuel flow is actually measured at this point. All it is really is a pressure measurement. The fuel starts here and goes through these delivery lines into these injector nozzles and arrives in the cylinders. But what you really want to look at is the net result of combustion. And you do that with an EGT probe. And this is your EGT probe right here. And of course, it's located downstream enough of these cylinders so that you're seeing the net result of combustion for all three of these cylinders. We'll button up the cowling on this engine, and then Cass will take me from startup through shutdown on proper mixture management using the EGT. Well, you know, Phil, even though this is a twin-engine turbocharged plane, it's still a good one to demonstrate EGT usage in because you have a fairly representative system here. You've got a single probe system on each engine with an analog needle display. We'll be looking to set up peak EGT, which on your gauge falls about where the diamond is right here. And the significance of peak EGT is that that's the mixture at which you get an optimum combination of fuel and air for the best, cleanest combustion. Okay, clear props. Clear. At this point, I would begin leaning. No, I never lean when I'm at idle or taxi. Well, most people don't, but they probably should. You can lean anytime you're below 75% power, and while you're idling on the ground, your engines are running very, very rich. So you should lean at least a little bit. There's no way you're going to hurt your engines when you're idling. Well, you're the pro, and you're closest to those mixture controls, so you manage the mixture during this flight. Well, we're at sea level. We won't need to pull these back very far, but we'll just bring it back a little bit and maybe try for best RPM. But something about like that is going to uh, let us have a nice lean mixture while we taxi so our plugs don't get all loaded up. Twin Cessna 2-4 Charlie Pop at the Habitat to taxi over to a run-up area. Before takeoff checklist, throttle 1700. Wait a minute, we want to go to full ridge for run-up. Oh, that's right, new procedure. Bill, if this were a high-density altitude situation where takeoff performance was critical and you were in a normally aspirated airplane, you'd probably want to lean on takeoff. And that means you would pull into position and hold, open the throttle all the way, and then try to lean for best RPM. Twin Cessna 4, Charlie Papa, clear for takeoff. 4, Charlie Papa. Okay, we can lean in uh, cruise climb. We don't want to lean too aggressively because we want some fuel flow to be used for cooling, and we don't want to interfere with that. But we can come back a little bit on the fuel flow right about now, and if you have a fuel flow gauge, use fuel flow gauge to do this rather than EGT. Now, Kaz, we're going to level off here at 11.5, and what should I do now about leaning? Well, first just get the plane squared away and 
set up whatever you feel is an appropriate power setting for this altitude. Well, Kaz, I'll normally cruise at about uh, 30.5 inches, 2300 RPM, and I know that uh, I'm within ballpark on fuel flow at about uh, 100, uh, 105 pounds an hour each engine. All right, now that the power is set, why don't we go ahead and deal with cow flaps and trim, get the airplane set just the way we want it, and meanwhile that'll allow a little bit of time for the engines to stabilize and then we can go ahead and do the fine tuning. Bill, now we're ready to do our final leaning, and I think we'll start simply by finding peak EGT, because all leaning operations are done relative to peak EGT. And I'll try to demonstrate that with the right engine. First I'll bring the mixture control back, and the EGT will rise. And when it peaks, that's by definition peak EGT. Looks like it's going to peak right about there. Now the reason I know I'm at peak EGT is that if I lean any further than this, the EGT will fall. Sometimes you have to play around a little bit with it to get it just right. But there we can see I just went past peak falling again. It's all enriching. Let the EGT stabilize right at peak. Okay, that's peak EGT, and I noticed that your handbook says that you can operate continuously at peak EGT as long as you're below 65% power. You may not want to operate at peak EGT continuously, though. Some people like to operate, for example, at best power mixture, which is something entirely different. Best power mixture occurs when you enrich and Starting at peak, you enrich in 125 degrees. Now on your gauge, that's about five hash marks. And that would be approximately best power mixture right there. Considerably more fuel flow. Considerably more fuel flow, but considerably more performance. Yes. Well, we're beginning our descent now, Kaz. What's the proper procedure? Well, we certainly don't have to go to full rich, and it's not desirable to go to full rich at this point. We'll just leave the mixtures right where they are for the moment. In a normally aspirated plane, of course, you will want to enrich in approximately 3% per thousand feet just to compensate for the normal atmospheric lapse. All right, Cass, gear is down and locked, fuel pumps on low, we're coming up on uh, final approach. What's the proper procedure here? Well, many pilots would automatically go to full rich at this point, Phil, but you don't automatically have to. The fact is, if you're comfortable flying final approach leaned in this fashion, you can do so, as long as you remember, of course, to enrich and if you have to go around. I noticed the pilot operating handbook for this plane indicates I don't have to be full rich on uh, landing approach, but I'm compromising a bit of safety there. What am I doing for the engine? Well, on the plus side, many experts believe that you can actually shock cool an engine at low power in this mode just by going to full rich because you've been at high cruise altitude all this time and the fuel is ice cold coming out of those injector nozzles. Okay, Phil, now that we're back on the ground at idle power, let's do what we did before and make sure we're leaning the engines. Remember, any time you're below 75% power, you can and should lean. Okay, and shutting down, Ordinarily, I would say that if you have not been leaning on the ground, a wise technique would be to run the engines at 1100 RPM, maybe 1200, and then lean for best RPM and hold it there for a few seconds before you shut down. But we've been uh, pretty well leaned on the ground, so I think we can just go ahead and shut down. Okay. Cass, I can't thank you enough for sharing some very basic techniques on leaning with our viewers. And even if you're a renter pilot, you're bound to come upon a plane with an EGT, and hopefully what you've just seen will be very helpful.
One thing that we pilots may take for granted that could cost us dearly is the tying down of an airplane. Here are a few ideas to consider the next time you secure your aircraft. First, set the parking brake lightly. It doesn't take much pressure to keep the airplane from rolling around. Next, leave little or no slack in the ropes or chains, but don't pull too tightly so that gust forces are transmitted directly to the aircraft. Also, consider that tie-down rings are at structurally strong points on the airframe, and you can apply a lot of leverage throughout wings and fuselage by applying too much pressure to the ropes or chains. Don't tie the tail down so tightly that the nose is raised, increasing the angle of attack, thus adding greater lift forces to the wing and to tie-down lines. Most manufacturers recommend tie-down ropes or chains of sufficiently strong tensile strength, say in the order of 700 pounds or more. In fact, nylon rope is excellent because it's elastic and has good shock absorbing qualities. Now, if recommended by the manufacturer, external gust locks are excellent because they reduce stress on control cables during gusty winds. And if you are a pilot who frequents undeveloped airfields, then a very good investment would be for portable tie-down equipment. And these can easily be stowed in the back of the aircraft. Hurricanes or squall type winds can make easy prey for improperly secured airplanes, as can be seen here. If strong winds are on the way and escape is not possible, then consider some of the creative solutions pilots have used, all the way from adding makeshift cardboard spoilers to the top of the wings, to digging holes so that the main gear of a tail dragger can be lowered into, and thus the aircraft would be level to minimize the effect of wind on the wings. And one last thing, perhaps the greatest fear that we pilots have, even greater than the fear of a runaway Hobbs meter on a rental airplane, is the fear of trying to taxi out with the tail still tied down while all your buddies are looking. So that's why I always untie the tail first. Sometimes the brightest ideas come from small companies, and often they are run by the nicest people. Taxiing up in his bonanza is John Youngquist, the owner of Insight Instrument Corporation. Now, since 1981, he's been marketing his own invention that goes far beyond the capabilities of the very basic EGT gauge that Cass Thomas showed me how to use. The graphic engine monitor, or gem gauge, grew from John's own frustration as a pilot with the conventional EGT gauges. Now, luckily, he was a developer of microprocessor-based products, and he used this knowledge to come up with much more than an EGT. The gem finds the leanest cylinder on an engine. It enunciates EGT variations while in cruise. It reads CHT constantly, in addition to EGT, and it displays the information in a unique and understandable way for the pilot. Each cylinder is individually monitored, and all this on a two and one quarter inch instrument that doesn't need a switch to move from temp to temp. In order to really demonstrate the gem without any camera wiggle and to look at some actual engine difficulties, we've moved inside the hangar to use a simulator to drive this sophisticated monitoring system. The unit depicts a bar graph with stacks of orange plasma discharge lights. The gem displays one column to represent each cylinder. Just like a thermometer, the higher columns represent higher temperatures. Each bar equals 25 degrees. Now notice here that the simulator is showing the number three cylinder is five bars or 125 degrees higher than the others. Now while all this is going on, the gauge also shows cylinder head temperatures. The blank bar in each column acts as a pointer depicting CHT on that particular cylinder. If we look at the scale on the right side of the instrument, you can see that the number three cylinder is running at 450 degrees, while almost all the others are at 250. While fuel economy is a byproduct of proper leaning, the real value in having a graphic engine monitor is to precisely manage and diagnose what's happening with your airplane's power plant at all times, either on the ground or in the air. 
John, what's the advantage of seeing all this information at the same time rather than each cylinder separately? Well, instruments that only display a single temperature at a time only give you 8% of the picture. The graphic engine monitor gives you 100% all the time. Now, some of my friends have uh, a digital readout on their EGT that you can select with a switch to four or six, any one of four or six cylinders. Why no temperature for your EGT? Well, during the development of the graphic engine monitor, we use digital instrumentation to collect data to study and uh, help design the instrument. We collected thousands of readings in the airplane in all modes of flight, and we determined uh, from that that numbers were of no value in the airplane. The uh, real key to lean the engine is to lean relative to peak EGT, and that changes all the time. And the real key to diagnosis is to identify changes relative to all the other cylinders in the airplane, and the numbers tend to confuse that. John, let's use your simulator to take our viewers through a typical engine start up to cruise in an airplane. Okay, well here's what you see when you first turn on the uh, instrument. Uh, during startup, the wide uh, temperature range of the gem shows indications immediately. During uh, taxi, the temperatures will increase, and very quickly the cylinder head indications will begin to show. Uh, here's an example during run-up where the temperatures are rising and cylinder heads are showing up in the 250 to 275 degree range. Here, for example, is a mag check during run-up. There's a left mag, here's the right mag, and they, one reads a little higher than the other, meaning they're missed time slightly. Mm -hmm. Here's both mags again. Here's an example where one mag has a bad plug. Here's an example where the other mag has a different bad plug. Now, if I were looking at this on just an RPM gauge and didn't have this gauge, I'd see a pretty even drop between both mags. You'd see a drop that would be the same on both sides, and you'd be unaware that you really have a failure on both magnetos. John, I don't have enough fingers to count how many times I've done a mag check with a drop on one side. Back I go to the shop, and off comes the cowling. They pull all the plugs on that side, clean them, inspect the leads, reinstall, then the cowling goes back on, and they run up the engine. A guaranteed hour and a half of labor, and at least a two-hour late departure. Well, if you had a graphic engine on your airplane, Phil, you wouldn't have to wait two hours every time you had a simple problem, like a fouled spark plug. In this case, solar number five contains a bad plug, and you can go back to the hangar and ask your mechanic to uh, pull the plug in solar number five, and your problem will go away. In fact, if you had a foul plug in flight, what you'd see is a cylinder blinking at you, and you couldn't miss it. How about takeoff, John? Here's a typical illustration of takeoff. The exhaust gas temperatures are nice and uniform. The cylinder head temperatures are well within limits. Here's an example of a serious problem. This is pre-ignition. Exhaust gas temperature is extremely high. Cylinder head temperature is high. And the engine is about to come apart in your hands. The jam owes its advanced capabilities not only to John Youngquist, but to this chip, a powerful Intel microprocessor. In one of two operating modes, the lean mode, the gem looks for the leanest cylinder. As the mixture control is moved toward lean to reduce fuel flow, the EGTs rise towards peak. The first to peak is being simulated now. Now the hottest cylinder, in this case three cylinders, two, four, and six, are not always the leanest. The leanest cylinder, number three, is the first cylinder to reach its own peak during the leaning process. After finding peak, the pilot hits the reset button to stop the flashing and then richens the mixture to one or more bars below peak, as called for by the particular engine operating manual. The whole process is accomplished in a matter of seconds. Now the monitor mode is the normal cruise position for the gem. Here the microprocessor is doing all the work by constantly sampling, storing, and comparing engine temperatures. Any rise in EGT of 50 degrees or more is enunciated. The column continues to blink until the pilot acknowledges the problem. Now this indication is typical of a fouled plug. By switching mags, you can identify which plug is at fault, and just like during run-up, point your mechanic toward the problem area. When all bars rise and flash, you've got a mag problem. Hitting the reset button will stop the flashing and displays the current temperatures. In this case, they've returned to normal, indicating a momentary mag misfire, thank goodness, rather than the complete failure. John, so far we've concentrated on the EGT portion. What about cylinder head temperature? Well, in this example, the cylinder head temperature reveals that there's a broken ring in cylinder number three. There's not enough cylinder damage to cause it to show up in exhaust gas temperature yet. In this case, the customer found this problem just prior to the FAA inspecting his airplane as part of an STC program. And had they found the broken ring, it would have been a very embarrassing time. 
With the knowledge my airplane is turbocharged, and perhaps because he's a super salesman, John had the foresight to bring along the GEM Model 603, which displays turbine inlet temperature at the top of the screen on a digital readout, in addition to the EGT CHT features we've just shown. Now, for my twin engine airplane, I'd need two units, however, and the labor involved in wiring out to each engine of a twin is a little more extensive than a single. Perhaps a twin engine gauge in one housing. Then all I'd need would be a relative who was an A&P and willing to do the installation on my 340 in his spare time. For singles, the installation time is much less, running about five to eight hours, depending on the model and the number of cylinders. Cost of the single engine six cylinder model 602 is $1,799, including wiring harness and all probes. It's difficult to see how dollars can keep the serious owner pilot from managing that single power plant up front with such a useful addition. About two years ago, John's brother Bob joined him in the company. Look for more unique products in the future from these two brothers and their small but unique company that had the foresight to attack a 20-year-old technology in a very sophisticated and useful way. Without question, North American Aviation's P-51 Mustang remains America's most famous fighter. Initially ordered by the British in 1940, it didn't become well known until the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine was adapted to the airframe, making it an excellent long-range escort for Army Air Force's bombers. Without effective fighter cover, bombers proved to be extremely vulnerable to enemy fighters. By the end of 1943, it got so bad in the 8th Air Force that there was a real possibility of halting deep penetration into Germany. Fortunately, the design genius behind the Mustang allowed it to be adapted to flying long distances and then tangling with enemy fighters. With drop tanks, it had a realistic combat radius of 1,000 miles, enough to cover the bombers to and from any target on the globe. Though it had a number of serious teething problems, the Merlin-powered Mustang enabled strategic bombing to succeed. It seemed to have had just the right balance of speed, maneuverability, range, handling. There were no more fiercely devoted pilots than those who flew 51s. What pilot hasn't dreamed of checking out in a Mustang? Everything about it gets the juices flowing, and what a shape. It stands for the essence of what makes flying attractive. When I grew up, it was around Mustangs, since my dad commanded a few squadrons of them. Ever since I was three, I thought this is what all airplanes must be. One of my life goals was to fly the 51, and since I have the good fortune to do that fairly often, I thought you'd like to come along on an initial checkout and relive the thrill with me. Through the generosity of Elmer Ward, owner of Man of War here, and of the major Mustang parts company, Pioneer Aero, at Chino, California, we have one of the finest restorations in the world at our disposal. There are two essentials to flying the Mustang a mastery of the AT-6 trainer, and the pilot's handbook. Those of us who fly both the P-51 and the T-6 regularly often joke that we should reverse the process and train a would-be T-6 pilot by running him through the 51 first. I know that sounds funny, but in my opinion, there's absolutely no substitute for a good dose of T-6 time with a good amount of it from the rear seat. Before flying any high-performance aircraft, the pilot's handbook must be studied and an oral test given by the instructor to the prospective student. Anecdotes of those who've tried to shortcut the process are usually very sad to hear. Whenever I'm away from the P-51 for more than a few months, I get this handbook out, I study it, I memorize things I might have forgotten, and I read through it thoroughly. I remain amazed at how much slips my mind, and familiarity often does breed contempt. The first thing we can do is jump up on the wing, get into the cockpit. We'll want to check that the battery and generator switches are off on the right, that the magneto switches are off on the left side of the cockpit up in the instrument panel. Then we'll look down and unlock the controls and make sure they're free. That looks good to me. Now we'll check the fluid levels in the engine and the hydraulics. The first door closest to the windscreen has the hydraulic reservoir in it. You just pull the stick and make sure you got enough fluid inside. It's easy to see it's red. That's very simple to check. Then we move over to the oil door. 
which has the oil tank behind the engine. Pull the stick. Between 7 and 12 gallons is fine. And then the first time before you fly every day, you want to check the coolant levels. The first door has the after coolant in it. And the far door on the left side of the nose has the header tank access door. And you just make sure it's full. Unzeusing a Merlin is never a boring experience, no matter how many times you fly these things. And I, I enjoy it. It gets me ready to get in there and go flying. Another thing you want to check for in a Merlin are broken exhaust stacks. Uh, they can be split or burnt, so you do what we call tinkling the stacks. As long as they tinkle and don't thunk, you're in pretty good shape. You want to check the other side as well. One of the things you want to check, assuming you don't have a plug for this, is the carburetor air scoop. Uh, you want to make sure no little creature might have crawled in there during the night to block your air for the engine. The only way to do it is to chin yourself up. All clear. Rather than give you a complete pre-flight on the P-51, I thought I'd show you a few things that were a little different. These big fairing doors really do catch people's attention. Uh, these things are up, they come down, and the gear cycles, and these shut. There's a sequencing valve for that. If it gets out of shape, you're in bad trouble. So you want to check it. It's on the other side. You want to check the hydraulic accumulator for 400 pounds of pressure. All these small lines and rods that activate the gear, the gear up lock, the fairing door lock, very important. They're very small, and there are no emergency systems in here. And you're looking at here at the gear down lock pin. These are very important to check. They're spindly, so you want to make sure they're in good shape, properly positioned. And then the gear strut itself, inflation of the strut, and maybe leaky brakes. That's about all down here. Another interesting thing about the Mustang, it has a fabric rudder. This is a leftover from 30s technology. It also has a de-boost tab on the rudder. As you deploy the rudder, this pushes out and it gets harder and harder to work, the opposite of a servo tab. The reason for this is, in World War II, if you did a snap roll or a violent maneuver with the rudder, it tended to tear the tail off. And the only way they knew to stop that was to de-boost it. And let me tell you, in flight, at over 350 miles an hour, this is very tough to move. It works. Your foot isn't going to move much of the rudder. Of course, a major pre-flight item on any Mustang is to check the guns. You want to make sure that if you have enemy fighters lurking around, you're ready to go. We've got the Merlin unzoosed here, so you can get a good look at it. Uh, average overhaul time in uh, World War II was 200 hours. Uh, now we figure we can get more than that. Elmer here has 800 on his. I think that's probably the highest before overhaul of anybody I know. Uh, engine overhaul costs are $55,000, and propeller is about the same cost. So as a pilot, you're very careful about engine management. You don't want to hurt this thing. It's too expensive. I love this cockpit. It's wonderfully organized. It's really a combat cockpit. It's, it's kind of obvious. It's straightforward. You've got the stick, of course, in the middle, ailerons, elevator. It's got a non-standard spade grip. It's a British grip. Here, you've got rudders, as you can see me moving them down there, with the brakes at the top of the pedal, of course. And then moving around to the left of the cockpit, you can see how well organized it is. You could probably fly it without a checklist. Flaps all the way down here at the bottom. Carburetor air controls. Coolant doors. This is the glycol. This is the oil. Then the trims, rudder, aileron, elevator. And below that is the gear handle, up and down, of course. Then above that, the throttle quadrant, well organized. Mixture from idle cutoff to run, propeller. And then the throttle with this marvelous bicycle grip on it. You can grab that thing and you'll never let go of it. And then the transmit button, of course, just super for holding on to. Then as you move down onto the bottom of the instrument panel, these are the engine controls for starting primarily and the supercharger control. Gives you a boost pump, pre-oil start, and primer. The general instrument layout is standard World War II. It's surrounded by a yellow bar. That includes the six major instruments, airspeed, altimeter, attitude, climb and dive. Up in the top, we've got a clock and a remote magnetic compass. Then as we move over to the right of the panel, we've got suction, manifold pressure, RPM, then a very important gauge. The most important one in the cockpit, really, is the coolant temperature. Uh, if that's in the green, you're in good shape. You can see trends, good or bad. And then you've got oil temperature as well, very important to watch, and, of course, oil pressure. You watch these three the most, coolant and the two oil gauges. Then in the middle, the radio group, that's sometimes hard to deal with because it's low. You've got to lean into the cockpit. And then down at the bottom, we have the fuel selector, left and right, and fuselage tank in the middle. We don't have that anymore. And the drop tanks. And then the hydraulic control, this is the thing that I pull out to activate the hydraulics, and you let it go. 
and if the engine's running, this pops right up to about 1,000 pounds. All that's left is the electrical controls on the right side, and that's circuit breakers and generator and battery, that kind of thing. Straightforward, a wonderful cockpit. Okay, before we start checklists, flaps are up, carburetor heat and carburetor normal, and ram air, throttle cracked one inch, mixture is an idle cutoff, prop is in full increase, brakes are set, and we usually don't use a parking brake, just hold them with our feet. Supercharger is in low, fuel shut off when they're in or on, but we've taken most of those out. Fuel selector is on the main right, because that's the fullest tank now. Magnetos are off, fairing door release is in, and the generator is on. The only thing to watch for on startup is over priming, which can cause a very exciting stack fire. And if that, that happens, the key is to keep cranking the engine over so that the flames will be drawn back into the engine. Okay, we're all set for start. We'll turn on the starter, engage the primer. When she fires, we'll go to mags on and then feed in the mixture. Okay, she's fired up real well. We now have 100 pounds of oil pressure, which is just plenty. That's all we needed to look for. And we're all set. I want to warm up a little bit. I don't believe too much in running away with a cold engine. What you really want to do is get to 45 or 50 degrees on the oil. And that provides a nice warm body of oil to warm the engine up and do the run-up with. Okay, all set. We'll taxi out to the run-up area. Here we go. Release brakes. Stick fully forward for a swivel. Up on the power a little. And then we'll apply a little bit of right brake. And that allows the airplane to swivel around quite easily. And I'll hit a little bit of left brake to stop the swing. Yeah, working real good. Then I'll pull the stick back for tailwheel steering. And I don't have to use the brakes very much. It's very easy to steer on the ground. The only thing you, you can't do is see is the engine is in the front, so you really have to S-turn. There have been great stories of these airplanes chewing other airplanes up because the pilot couldn't see what was in front of him. So the key is to keep it at about this speed and keep it turning so we can get a look around the nose there. Yeah, nothing out there. Swing around again with the stick in full swivel. That's full forward. Full swivel. Allows real tight maneuvering. It's an ingenious system. You just got to be careful that you don't pull the stick fully forward with a lot of power because, of course, full forward stick. It doesn't take two and two to add up to that down elevator. And uh, the manual says that at 40 inches, this thing will nose over, even with full back stick. So you don't want that to happen. Okay. We're all set. We'll let it warm up some more. Okay, now we've got uh, about 50 degrees on the oil temperature, which is good. Coolant's is just coming up to 90, so we're coming up to 2300 RPM for the run-up. be a lot of engine noise here. And this is really strange because the first time you do it, you feel like you got takeoff power and a Cessna or something. This isn't even cruise power. So we'll cycle the prop 300 RPM, get some warm oil up in the dome. Yeah, looks good. Another cycle. Yeah, real nice. And we'll check the mags. Right mag, 100 drop, excellent. Left mag, 120 drop max, excellent, it's only 75. Good shape, we'll super cycle the supercharger to high. Get a 50 RPM drop, excellent. Go back to low, bring the power back. Now all that noise wasn't even cruise. It's just always amazing to me that that's the case. Cycle the flaps. Yep, get a visual, excellent. Bring it back up. And now we'll do the before takeoff checklist. Harness locked, altimeter is set, rudder trim is six degrees right, elevator trim is zero, aileron trim is zero, canopy's locked, carburetor is in ram air, radiators in auto, and we'll call the tower. Mojave Tower, this is Mustang 727, ready for 25 intersection. Mustang 727, runway 25, cleared for takeoff. Okay, 727's on the roll. We just come firmly up to 50 inches of manifold pressure. Let the speed build up, I got a fair amount of right foot in. Let the tail come up, and she'll just fly right on off on her own. There she goes, broken ground, reach down, bring up the gear. 
And the gear is coming up pretty smartly. Oh, and accelerates real good here. We're going through 150 miles an hour already. Bring back the first power reduction, 46 inches at 2,700 RPM. Oh yeah, she's accelerating real good. Reach trip the right rudder a bit. We always carry a vice grip with us on these takeoffs for the gear handle because uh, the handle's been known to break. Fortunately, Pioneer Arrow builds a handle that doesn't break, and all of us are trying to retrofit them. Second power reduction down to 42 inches for a climb out and 2400 RPM. Smooth as glass, another uh, re readjustment on the rudder trim because every time you change power or speed, it really does need a trim change. Here we go, left turn. Look out for other traffic and the visibility out of a P-51 is absolutely outstanding. It was made, of course, to search for enemy fighters, not get bounced, but for general aviation work, it's absolutely tremendous. Now we're in a slow cruise climb at 200 miles an hour. And if you want to save a little gas, you can come on back to 36 inches at 2400, which is what I'm doing now. Yeah, 36 and 24, that gives us a cruise climb of 200 miles an hour. And a climb rate, believe it or not, of about 2500 feet a minute. That's at low power. The key to the Mustang in any of this is pre-planning. The airplane is much faster than most general aviation airplanes, and therefore you've got to think about it ahead of time. You've got to be about two miles in front of the airplane. And of course, that's the same for jet aircraft as well. This isn't quite as easy to manage as a jet because you've got a mixture propeller and manifold pressure to worry about. In a jet, you just push the go lever up and it goes. It's not quite that way in this thing. But I love it. I love to fiddle with it. Control harmony in the Mustang is excellent. It's, uh, this one is particularly light. Uh, Elmer Ward has managed to tweak this airplane until it is truly wonderful. My dad flew it, and he said no Mustang he ever flew in the service flew this well. So this is a bit unusual. Most of them are quite stiff. But this thing will really, really go around. I mean, you can see I'm just, I'm barely fiddling with it at all. And this thing will, it has a tremendous roll rate. So it's, uh, it's got just a wonderful feel to it. I have to say that I enjoy flying Elmer's airplane every time because he takes such good care of it. Okay, in a high-speed cruise, uh, if we wanted to go fast, I'd leave it up at uh, uh, 36 inches and 2200 RPM, or a lot of guys uh, go 2300 and 36, and that will give you a, a pretty quick cruise, but it will also use a little more fuel. Uh, on most of my cross-country flying, I'm used to burning about 55 gallons an hour, and a lot of guys push it up to 65 to 70 to get the extra speed. Uh, turn coordination in the P-51 is very, very crucial. You do have to keep the ball in the middle, and any movement of the interrods will tend to throw the ball out. So you, you step on the ball. You really must do it every time. If you don't, you cross-control the airplane. That's not so bad at altitude where you've got speed because, of course, you're just wallowing around. But you get in the pattern with the gear and the flaps down, and you cross control, at slow speed, it'll snap. It'll stall and snap over the top. And a spin takes about a thousand feet to recover from per turn. And uh, you could hit the ground before you'd ever know what's happening. Uh, there's nothing magic about a stall in a P-51. It can be dangerous. It will snap and roll over the top if the ball's out of the middle, and it, it does drop a wing, as you'll see. So the first thing you want to do is, of course, bring the power back to less than the speed. We've got a very low gear speed of 170 miles an hour, so you got to bring the nose up and uh, let the speed bleed off. You can put on several notches of flap under 400 miles an hour, which is very nice. So I put on two notches of flap now. Let the airplane slow down. And your feet have got to move every power change. My right foot's going down now because I've got that big gyroscope out front. 11 foot, 2 inch diameter. And as the nose comes up and the speed goes down, I've got to put my foot down to keep it coordinated. I want to keep the stall coordinated. I could show you one uh, that's uncoordinated, but I don't like them. Okay, here comes the gear. Gear down. And we'll just keep bleeding her back, bleeding her back, bleeding her back. 87 miles an hour is the book stall, and every one of these things incredibly stalls at the book speed, almost no matter what the gross weight is. So here we go, We've got to feed in more right rudder, more right rudder, more right rudder. Here we are, 90, 90, 90, 90. And I feel a nibble, here comes the nibble, and we're gonna get it, there she goes. It wants to start to spin, of course, left wing drop. 
So the whole idea is to compensate that with rudders. And once you compensate for it with the rudder, she just sails right out. Now that's another thing about World War II airplanes. You really can't do all this without using the rudder. The whole problem is that people tend to want to lift the wing or raise the wing with an aileron, and that just stalls the wing deeper. But you just got to pay attention. Now, in order to lock the gear down, let's say you've had a gear failure in the sense of hydraulics, there are no emergency systems in a Mustang, uh, believe it or not. So, for a gear loss, a hydraulic pressure loss to lower the gear, you pull the hydraulic jump handle down the bottom. That lets the gear free fall because it dumps the pressure uh, from the system with the gear handle down. Now, to get it down, what you do is you, you yaw it like this and the gear just pops right into place. Normally it'll pop in without that, but uh, if you're having trouble getting it down, just go ahead and yaw it, and she goes plunk plunk, and then you, you land. You should get three green lights out of that. And you want to always bring the gear down with one firm motion, because if you don't, the sequencer might not know what's going on, and you end up with the fairing door staying up, and the, uh, the gear will come up and actually hit the doors and not go into the wells, or one will go up and one will go down, and it really looks crazy from the ground. Uh, that's gonna be pretty scary. Uh, so one firm motion, and one firm motion up every time you deal with the gear. Okay, now we'll try a loop with a roll off the bottom. Basically, you just point the nose down. You want about uh, 300 miles an hour, no less than that, although some guys can loop them out of cruise. Uh, I prefer to sort of let other people do that. Uh, I don't consider myself all that good at it. Uh, so I let the speed build up to 300, get the nose pitched down fairly well. And you're going to have to change speed on the rudders. Now i got a lot of left rudder in. Keep the ball centered. And you do want that ball centered over the top. There we go. 300 miles an hour. And we do a fairly smart pull. Here we go. Up over the top, pulling about 3 Gs. 4, yeah, four Gs now. Here we go. Nurse her on over, start looking for the horizon. There she is, bring her on around, moderate stick pressure a little, balls in the middle. Let her sail down the back side, gain a little speed. Looking good, here she comes. And for fun, why don't we do a roll? Here we go, got the speed, and around she goes. Oh yeah, oh boy, is that fun. And Zappo. And around, she goes around just beautifully because she's so smooth. There you can see it. That's not too difficult. Now when you descend back into an airport, you've got to be careful because you can really overspeed. I've been low cruise here and coming up on 300 miles an hour and legal below 10,000 feet is 250 knots. This airplane will do that without a heartbeat. If you want to pre-plan all this, again, you've got to start descent sometimes as as far as over 100 miles out. It's very similar to a jet. Okay, before landing, fuel's on full tank. Boost pump is on. Mixture's in normal. And we'll bring the prop up to 2,700 RPM. Coming down in for the 360 degree overhead approach. I prefer these kinds of approaches, much more so than the general aviation downwind to base style. You can come in with a lot of speed. You can have a lot of good visibility. You make sure there's no one in the pattern. And if you lose the engine, you've got plenty of speed to zoom climb and make the field. Mustang 727, our initial. Mustang 727 on the left, brake at your discretion. 727. And there is a pilot drive here of a low approach at 320 miles an hour. Break up into the downwind, I've got a gear horn, two notches of flap, speed speeding off, and of course the whole idea is to get the gear speed, which is very low, it's uh, 170, so you've got to let the speed come on back, prop up to 2700 RPM. Not only does that prepare you for a go around, but it also gives you a very flat break out the front, so it tends to slow you down as well. There's 170, gear down. the gear horns off and I've got three green lights. 
Radiators are in auto. Gears down, flaps full below 165 miles an hour. And I'm all set. Short final, full flap. Every time I move the power, I gotta move my feet because that gyroscope changes the trim. At this point is probably one of the more difficult parts of flying a Mustang. We're gonna simulate something here. We're on short final. And we're going to assume that a, an aircraft is pulled out in front of us. And we're gonna go around. So we, we've heard 2,700 RPM, so I immediately apply 46 inches, which is climb speed. Your foot really has to go down in order to counter the torque. And it's like losing an engine in a twin. I've got a real honest to goodness VMC problem here. So you bring the gear up, and then you start bringing the flaps up. You gotta build the flaps up, and now she's accelerating away again. But it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't gain any speed, and it's very difficult to do sometimes. Come back to normal climb, I'll come back to 42 and 2400. We're at 120. On a short final, that's what we want for the fence. By the time we go over the numbers, we should be close to 90, which will flare right out and should give us a nice landing. All three points down at once, that's my preference. I really do like three-point landings because once the tail wheel's on, it's going to steer. Uh, whereas if you have a, a, a wheel landing, which is okay, the tail's got to come down sometime, and in a crosswind, I can tell you, that tail will rudder vane. So I prefer this kind of a landing, and my feet are really active right now, as you probably see from the rudder behind me. And I'm just going to let it roll because I'm going to save the brakes. I'm not in a great hurry to burn my brakes up. Well, they're not mine, they're Elmer's. And she's rolling out good. Uh, open the canopy, get a little snow of that exhaust. Okay, as we're coming around, I'll we'll bring the flaps up. I'll turn the boost pump down to off. And I'll turn the uh, doors into manual. And I'll put the coolant door full open. And that gives us maximum cooling because you don't have much air passing through this radiator on the ground. And uh, you don't want to overheat. If you overheat, a little plug pops out of the uh, block on the engine and you get a Stanley Steamer out front instead of a Mustang, and that's no fun. Okay, we'll bring her back into the wind here. Bring it up to 1,500 RPM. Get fresh coolant into the banks. That's really all there is to it. I'll turn the radio off while I'm at it. And the mixture comes up to idle cutoff. There she goes. Let her wind down. Everything looks normal. Low pressure, oil pressure coming down. Turn the bags off. And the battery generator off, and that'll do it. Minutes in the Mustang are worth hours in any normal GA airplane. It never gets old. But it can be dangerous if the aircraft isn't respected. I remember receiving a very nice compliment after a particularly good landing at an air show. The girlfriend of one of the better known Mustang pilots said, looks like you've got the Mustang tamed. I would love to have said, yep, with the John Wayne modesty. But instead, I, I just had to say, it's more like the Mustangs tamed me. Careless habits are not forgiven and you have to pay attention constantly. It's not a hard airplane to fly, but things happen very fast. During my first Mustang checkout with Gordon Plaskett in his dual control TF-51, he gave me his three rules on flying the Mustang. Number one, don't go too slow. Number two, don't go too slow. Number three, don't go too slow. It's good advice all the way around. Memorize the manual, get a good feel for the cockpit, pay attention, and above all, fly it. You're the pilot, not the airplane. Don't be a passenger sitting back on the runway while the airplane blasts away toward the horizon carrying your little pink body with it. As long as we have the fuel, pilots will continue to fly this most famous of fighters, and they'll do it safely for generations to come. Well, when do we go for the next lesson? I'm ready. 
I hope you'll agree that this video edition contained aviation stories oriented to a broad cross-section of the pilot community. And my personal thanks to new contributors Jeff Ethel and Kaz Thomas. But it's not over yet. In just a moment, our Wide World of Flying Bonus Buyer's Guide has several new manufacturers who have product information of interest to anyone who flies. And a reminder that many of you have subscriptions that expire with this video issue. If you had a renewal envelope attached to the mailing package that contained your tape, please send the invoice back promptly. Your support keeps our unique product coming out every three months and at an affordable price. Recently, as a pilot, I've been either asked to renew or subscribe to some of the print newsletters that are designed for pilots. Your video cassette subscription to ABC's Wide World of Flying doesn't cost much more, yet it features the sight, sound, and motion that only television can bring to this exciting endeavor. And if you've already renewed, thanks. In our next video issue, the first of year three, Bill Cox does one of his outstanding left seat, or perhaps I should say center seat checkouts, in the popular Cetabria and Decathlons, the aerobatic planes at an affordable price. And I'll be in the left seat, or the hot seat, when I attend flight safety for the initial course on my Cessna 340. You'll get a full look at what it's like to go through this intensive training on a particular aircraft type including some sessions in the full motion simulator. Right now, stay with us for the bonus buyer's guide and safe flying to you all. Watch closely. You're about to see thunderstorms in a whole new light. Center, this is Gulfstream 40 Victor. I'm showing thunderstorm activity at Renew Intersection. Request deviation. Introducing the new StormScope Series 2 weather mapping systems from 3L. Quite simply, the most advanced, most precise airborne instruments available for detecting, mapping, and circumnavigating thunderstorms. Designed by 3M for pilots who want the best. The Weather Almanac defines thunderstorm as a storm always accompanied by thunder and lightning. Precipitation may or may not be present. Lightning always is. Weather radar maps areas and rates of precipitation. Stormscope Series 2 systems locate and map electrical discharges and visible lightning. Many times the best indicators of hazardous turbulence and convective wind shear and they do it with greater precision than any other airborne lightning or thunderstorm detection instruments available. More than a decade of experience and several years of concentrated research and development went into StormScope Series 2 systems. 3M's goals for the new generation StormScope system were precision ranging, outstanding reliability and a multi-purpose display capable of providing pilots with a variety of additional information. A testbed aircraft was specially instrumented for engineering evaluations. Ergonomics analyses were conducted. Round triangulation stations, human factors simulators, and environmental test chambers to simulate weather changes were constructed. 3M developed state-of-the-art electronic circuitry, applied human factors expertise, researched innovative new technologies for determining the precise location of electrical discharges in thunderstorms, and tested the systems for thousands of hours, in the laboratory and in flight. 
3M committed the time and money required to make the new Stormscope systems the systems that set the standards. The result is thunderstorm mapping technology so new, so advanced, and so unique, it requires new patents. Thunderstorm ranging precision, verified by ground triangulation, and fully flight tested. Thunderstorm mapping instruments that deliver an extended mean time between failure. Thunderstorm mapping systems that are, quite simply, the best. Stormscope Series 2 systems store your checklists, keep track of your time, give you 360 degree views of thunderstorm activity within a radius of 200, 100, 50, and 25 nautical miles, even before you start your engine. You can plan your route of flight before takeoff and make go or no-go decisions based on facts. Stormscope systems display a 25 nautical mile range ring at all times to give you a safety reference. Switch to the 120 degree weather mode for a clear, expanded view of your forward path. Each green discharge point indicates an electrical discharge. The number of discharge points and the rate at which they appear indicate the intensity of the thunderstorm and the severity of the associated turbulence and convective wind shear. Circumnavigating the hazards of thunderstorms was never easier. Just avoid the discharge point clusters. For the most current five-year reporting period, the National Transportation Safety Board attributes 150 general aviation accidents and more than 230 fatalities to thunderstorm-related conditions. If you're interested in the most advanced, most precise thunderstorm mapping instruments, see the Stormscope Series 2 weather mapping systems from 3M you'll see thunderstorms in a whole new light. The best light. ICOM, world leader in communications technology, has introduced an enhanced version of the popular ICOM A2 handheld airband transceiver. Called the Navicom, the new ICOM A20 includes VOR navigation and a course deviation indicator in a handheld unit. Before we show you VOR navigation with the A20, consider the features common to both radios. The ICOM A2 has 10 memory channels. The ICOM A20 has 16. This means instant access to your most frequently used Unicom, ATC, ATIS, and VOR frequencies. The ICOM A2 and the new ICOM A20 receive all 200 NAV and all 720 COM channels and transmits on all authorized COM channels. Both the ICOM A2 and A20 are built on an integrated metal frame. This means plenty of cooling for the transmitter for peak efficiency, an effective ground system for the internal antenna, and structural integrity for long-term reliability. The heritage of the A2 and A20 comes from ICOM's proven commercial radio line for professional communication. With the ICOM A20's unique memory scan lock capability, you're able to scan some of your most frequently used frequencies. Both the A2 and A20 are also unusually rugged and weather and dust resistant. The keypad and switches are protected, and the speaker is made of a mylar composite to resist moisture for long-term reliability you can count on with ICOM. ICOM is programmed so you can easily work duplex operation, being able to listen on a VOR frequency and automatically transmit on a COM frequency as needed. In addition to squelch, an effective automatic noise limiter significantly reduces irritating impulse type noise generated by single engine piston aircraft. When you need to use either the ICOM A2 or A20 for extended periods, you can pick up extra CM7 or CMG battery packs or for 12 volt operation, simply use the IC CM1 cigarette lighter cable, which is supplied with the unit. 
for charging. The CM16 wall charging unit is also included. The CM12 battery pack allows use of commonly available AA alkaline batteries. Or the CM35 quick charger can bring a CM7 or 7G battery pack up to full charge in just an hour and a half. Included with both radios is a flexible antenna, rainproof cap, earphone plug, the CM1 cigarette lighter cable, CM16U wall charger, and a protective carrying case. Optional are ICOM's unique HS20SB headset interface with adjustable side tone so you can hear yourself when you transmit, and the EM46 speaker microphone, an extra that you will find only with ICOM. All accessories for all of ICOM's other handheld lines are also interchangeable with the A2 and A20. These features alone make the ICOM A2 and A20 outstanding values and good investments. But ICOM has added a VOR nav display to the ICOM A20 to meet the needs of the general aviation community for a reliable portable navigation system. You're probably already familiar with the conventional VOR display on your instrument panel. On the ICOM A20, the same information is displayed in a simple digital format, allowing you to fly to or from a VOR. The process is simple and straightforward. When you tune in a VOR, you are immediately given the bearing. You may then select a to or from course with the A20. Simply pressing two more keys activates the course deviation indicator, or CDI. You may want to select a radial to fly, and then the CDI will provide course line information. With the easily selectable frequencies and memories, you can also cross-check your position by using two or more VORs. You can also monitor a localizer signal. Now think about what ICOM has built into the ICOM A20. A 720-channel communications band transceiver, 200-channel navigation receiver, plus a VOR digital display and frequency, bearing, to-from information, course deviation indicator, and localizer. ICOM has been manufacturing handhelds for over 20 years. We have taken all of our knowledge from the amateur marine and land mobile industries and combined it to create the ICOM A2 and A20 airband transceivers. Because of this background, ICOM's A2 and A20 are backed by a three-year limited warranty plus a lifetime service policy. In the unlikely event that repairs are needed, ICOM has four service centers in North America to serve you. The ICOM A2 and A20 Navicom, radios to get you where you're going, keeping you in contact with the ground. And now in the ICOM A20, giving you VOR navigation along the way. Versatility, dependability, and affordability. That's what keeps ICOM first in communications. Well, hello, fellow pilots. I'm John King. You know, sometimes a seemingly unimportant little tidbit of information can prove to be extremely valuable in flying. Well, here's Martha King with a tip from our newest takeoff video called Takeoffs and Landings Made Easy. Now, this tip will show how knowing runway width in advance just might make your next landing a lot smoother. Take a look at this particular runway. This runway seems to be a relatively short runway. Now take a look at this runway. This one seems to be quite a bit longer. The interesting thing is that these two runways are parallel runways and they're exactly the same length. Both of these runways are exactly 3,400 feet long. We're used to a certain relationship between the runway width and the length of the runway. Our mind holds a picture of what we consider to be normal. The left runway here is slightly narrower than usual. It's only 60 feet wide. Because it is narrow, it appears to be longer to the pilot. It also tends to make the pilot think he's coming in too high on approach, which can result in the pilot overcorrecting, flying a too low approach with a risk of striking obstructions or landing 
landing short. Now the right runway is unusually wide for a general aviation runway, at least for one that's only 3,400 feet long. This runway is 150 feet wide. Because it's wider than we expect for its length, it tends to look short to the pilot. It also tends to make the pilot think that he's coming in too low, which can result in a too high approach with the risk of overshooting the runway or of leveling out high and landing hard. Learning the runway width at your destination airport when you do your pre-flight planning can really help you fly a better approach. King Schools takes you to new heights with our Super Takeoff Sweepstakes. How would you like to win this beautiful brand new totally IFR equipped Piper Cadet? It's easy when you enter King Schools Super Takeoff Sweepstakes. Simply order any King video. Select from King's extensive and exciting new library of single subject action videos designed to take you beyond the written, including four of the latest entertaining yet practical takeoff videos. Flying the Citation, Communications, Hangar Flying with a Point, and Takeoffs and Landings Made Easy. Get the fun of flying along with the facts by ordering any single takeoff video for just $39 or any five for $79 or get all 11 for only $139. The highly acclaimed and popular King Written Exam courses are up to date and thorough, containing at least five two-hour videotapes. King Exam courses include Private Pilot, Commercial Pilot, Instructor FOI, Instrument, Instrument Instructor, ATP-121 Dispatcher, and Flight Engineer Exam courses. Right now, each exam course is only $149. That's a complete total price, $149. $149 includes the King exam course of your choice, plus your choice of the private, instrument, or commercial flight test courses, and your choice of any four of the King takeoff tapes, all for just an unbelievable $149. And don't forget, your order automatically enters you in the King School's Super Takeoff Sweepstakes. Your chance to own and fly this brand new 1989 Piper Cadet. Phone your order in now by calling 1-800-854-1001. That's 1-800-854-1001. We're here 24 hours a day to take your order, which is processed and shipped the same day it's received. The number to call is 1-800-854-1001. The price to pay is $149 for any King video exam course. You get your flight test course and four takeoff videos free. King's number, 1-800-854-1001. King's price, $149. And your dream, a brand new Piper Cadet. King Schools takes you where you want to go easily and enjoyably. It's the only way to fly. You can bank on it. From the Pilot's Video Source Collection comes previews of six more exciting aviation videotapes for your home library. Forty years after her last wartime flight, this freshly restored B-25 Mitchell bomber has her most challenging mission just ahead. To fly across the Pacific to a new home in Australia. Jump in her for the first test flight through the Grand Canyon. And then with a special belly tank, join the Goodwill mission across the Pacific. This is an aviation event of unique significance. Hosted by Glenn Ford. One 40-year-old military bomber that was never designed to do what it's attempting now. Striking out alone across the Pacific on her way to Australia. And all we can do is wish them Godspeed. A great aviation adventure. Everyone loves the Blue Angels, and their air show is hotter than ever because of the new F-18 Hornet. With its awesome thrust-to-weight ratio and impressive maneuverability, this is the greatest flight demonstration in the world today. But this tape lets you climb in the cockpit and get the pilot's eye view of the flight. Other Blue Angel tapes sell for as much as $79. We are very proud to be able to offer this all-new Blue Angels videotape for the very special price of just $19.95. Another brand new videotape from Pilot's Video Source features the Canadian Armed Forces Flight Demonstration Team, the Snowbirds. 
this highly skilled team flies an exciting routine with nine jet airplanes in tight wingtip to wingtip formations. Cockpit cameras give you the pilot's view that you'll never get at any air show. So forget the crowds and enjoy a top quality air show in the comfort of your own home for just $19.95. Before platoon and full metal jacket, there was the Anderson platoon. But this is not a Hollywood reenactment. This is the real thing. French producer Pierre Schoendorfer and his cameraman live with this combat unit, led by a handsome West Pointer, Lieutenant Joseph B. Anderson. For six weeks, they filmed the men of the platoon as they ate, slept, fought, and died. Winner of an Academy Award for Best Foreign Documentary, this film presents a view of the helicopter ground support role in Vietnam that you will never forget. From historical Moffett Naval Air Station near San Francisco comes a unique air show. This exciting two-hour videotape covers everything from experimental NASA airplanes, through the Brazilian flight demonstration team, Team America, and the Air Force Thunderbirds. This all-new videotape is produced with excellence and exciting cockpit views of the action. If you're an air show buff, you will enjoy this complete air show report. Thunderbolt. This is the story of the young American pilots who flew the P-47s of the 57th Fighter Group during Operation Strangle in World War II. This operation destroyed vital rail supply routes deep behind German lines and hastened the sweep of Allied forces into Rome. Introduced by Jimmy Stewart, directed by William Wyler and John Sturgis. This is a unique behind-the-scenes view of the base on Corsica and the low-level missions over Italy. One of the best documentaries ever produced during World War II, our print of Thunderbolt is the result of a painstaking restoration direct from a 35-millimeter negative. These sequences are easily some of the most spectacular ever filmed of War from the Air. With a superb script, excellent in-flight color footage, and a sensitive view of the brave young pilots in war. This is a videotape we are proud to offer from Pilot's Video Source. Thunderbolt is available from Pilot's Video Source for $24.95 plus $3 shipping and handling. But as a special offer to subscribers of ABC's Wide World of Flying, it is available free with any purchase of $99 or more. You may order any combination of tapes from the enclosed order form to qualify for this free offer. To order by credit card, call toll-free 1-800-223-3556. In California, call 1-800-445-4944. Please place your order between 9 and 5 Pacific Time, Monday through Friday. If necessary, use the pause button on your VCR to copy down these phone numbers. You may also return the enclosed card or write us at the address shown. The distributor's policy is that defective tapes may be returned for replacement. Don't miss this limited free tape offer. Order now. If you are viewing a borrowed copy of Wide World of Flying and would enjoy having your own subscription, or you would like to order a subscription as a very special gift for a pilot or aviation enthusiast, credit card holders may call us toll-free at 1-800-999-8783. Or you may send a personal check to our subscription center in Riverton, New Jersey. The price is just $99.95 for one full year.